hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. My name is Jason and love to everybody out there. Let's pray. Father, I come before you today and ask for your forgiveness and your cleansing and your mercies. And uh, I acknowledge the weakness of my heart and I acknowledge the corruption of my own heart. And Father, we just come before you today and I just pray that this video would be edifying, bring glory to your name and bless people out there that they might come to know you as Lord and Saviour. Amen. Hi folks, it's good to be with you. I just want to talk about our trip uh, to Hyde Park and then I want to uh, discuss a couple of debates that me and a brother called Mike had with uh, Mansour, who's a Muslim apologist, and uh, Paul Williams, a Muslim apologist. And we're, we're going to discuss uh, some of the things that they brought up. So, uh, the trip to Hyde Park, uh, we went down, uh, a team of us, four of us, one lady and three guys. And uh, we went down there, we met some Christians down there, and it was a good time. It was uh, a lot better than the first and second time. First time was okay, um, but it was still difficult. Uh, second time was very, very difficult. We went in winter where there were Muslims there. Um, and I just, I just, I couldn't do the work that I was supposed to be doing there. We had about 80 Muslim guys around us and they just would not let me preach really. It was really, really tough. So then we had uh, four of us this time. Uh, I didn't really want to go because of the second time. And someone on the team wanted to go, so they knew to that kind of thing. So I thought, well, if they want to go, we'll go. So we went and it was a lot, lot better. Uh, we had more freedom to speak and we were able to talk to one on one more without getting interrupted. Uh, so it was a lot, lot better. And uh, we had some uh, fruitful discussions with people. So I think it was worthwhile going down this time. Although personally myself, I wouldn't like to uh, go on a regular basis, but I know uh, one person in particular in the team wants to go down uh, and develop their skills in, in a in, uh, polemical debate and so I said I'll support them if that's the ministry that they want to do so. So I might be going down there uh, just to support my friend to, to develop their skills in apologetics. Um, anyway, when we was down there I got into a debate with Mansour. Now Mansour, if nobody knows, is He's probably one of the best debaters. He's, he's looked up to by a lot of Muslims there uh, in the in his ability to defend the Quran and he knows Arabic, he knows uh, sources of the uh, chain of narration uh, of the Quran. So people use him, uh, other apologists call him in when they're having debates, they call him in to help them in debates, right? So he's probably one of the best when it comes to defending the Qur'an uh, for its authentication or so-called authentication. So I got into this debate with a, an associate of his first and then and then him. His associate brought up the point about canon and I, if I can find it, I, I brought I brought up um, I, I can't find it here. But I brought up a piece of paper which he said he was impressed with quotations of the early church fathers and on the gospel the gospel of the, on the gospels and the uh, let the letters of the New Testament their quotations the regularity of their quotations as opposed to these other various gospels uh, false gospels and false uh, books and. Uh, it kind of silenced him and then Mansour came along and, and wanted to, to come in. Also his associate talks about canon and the word canon and I've read um, a bit here and there, I've read um, Bart Ehrman, I've read uh, Bruce Metzer, but I did a lot of work a few months ago on canon 
reading C, listening to C.H. Hill, uh, listening to Kruger and, and scholars who were opposing them. Um, what is apparent in, in the circles of uh, academia, there are debates about the word canon. And it comes back to a scholar called Dr. Brower, Bauer in the 1930s. And Dr. Bauer came up with the idea that there was no one fixed community that believed a certain beliefs in the early church, that there was a multiplicity of views and there was no one canon. And it was, flu it, it was flu fluctuating. <coughs> and these views have had, are influencing right now, and he, he was massively influential in academic circles on, on uh, the formation of the canon and, and looking at texts, ancient texts uh, of the New Testament. And uh, he, so people like Bart Ehrman and all, many of the textual critics are, are influenced by this guy. So Mansour uh, quoted, uh, to back his point up that he wanted to make, he, he, he quoted um, He quoted um, he quoted uh, um, an article from Islamic Awareness. Now I've been on Islamic Awareness. I did some preparation before I went down there and I went on the website Islamic Awareness. And what I found in on Islamic Awareness is that they don't point you in the direction of scholarship that's different from them. You know, it, it's a, a missionary polemical site for Islam. It's not. It's a biased source. So I don't. I. I mean, I will use. Um, you know, David Wood. I'll use uh, Christian uh, scholars who attack Islam or criticize Islam. I'll use them, but I won't. I won't quote the actual Christian scholar. I'll go and do my research and I'll go look at primary sources, like I'll go and look at the Hadiths myself, I'll check the Hadiths, I'll check the Quran, and then I'll go and look at Muslim scholars. So if I'm in a discussion, I will quote Muslim scholars. Where is what he was doing, he was just going to his own website, Islamic Awareness, and it was a biased source. Then he quoted uh, Bruce Metzer, and he, he gave one quote. Now, in the debate about canon and, and stuff, I, his view about canon, he was saying the book of Revelation took a, a long time getting in the canon, right? And, um, and so, therefore, there was no proper full canon. I'd already made the point early on that all the books of the New Testament were read, being regularly quoted by the early church fathers, therefore being seen by it as the word of God. And I also was intellectually honest and told him, that there were debates about the book of Revelation going up not only to the 4th century AD but right up to the Reformation. So I, mean, I was intellectually honest. But what he didn't want to let me get in, and there's lots of ad hominems where he's attacking me as a person, he called me gay, uh, I said, are you alright, do you love me? And he didn't want to say anything, I said, I love you, he's called me gay. So I, I, when, he, when he was going down to that level, I just wasn't taking him seriously. I just thought this guy's not in any way, shape, an intellectual for Islam. He, he, he's just shoddy in his scholarship, quoting from sites that a site that that backs him up. So I tried to explain to him about. I wanted to get to it. I wanted to help him to see that his view was looking at it from a perspective influenced by Dr. Ba Bauer, and he was not aware of this. And he, So he quotes uh, Bruce Metzer, and I asked him, have you read the book? He said, no. And then I pulled out a book uh, by Lee Strubble, which is not a scholarly book. And I said, well, let's read Bruce Metzer in here. And he's going, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, biased, he's a hypocrite. But he didn't let me get in. He didn't let me actually explain myself. He made a quotation. He gave a quotation from a biased website. He hadn't read the book. The book that I was bringing out had read, uh, Lee Strubble is not an academic, but he interviewed uh, Bruce Metzer. 
So it's a full interview without editing. It's what Bruce Metzer said, a full interview. So that is the source, not, not Lee Strubble, but the interview itself. So we can look at the interview and we have it all in context. So we can check whether what I'm saying is right or wrong. Whereas what, I'm, what I was saying with uh, Mansour, he's given a quotation, but, we, but he's not read the book and we don't know the context. You know, so he's going, oh, he's a hypocrite, he's a hypocrite, he's using by a source. You know, and I just thought, well, so anyway, so the, the debate progressed and I was just having a bit of fun. I was just having a laugh. I said to one brother, one Muslim, you, you know, will you do your buttons up, his buttons were down, you know what I mean? And I kept saying that just for a laugh and I just kept having a bit of fun, you know. I said, if there's any women out there want to marry me, I'm looking for a wife, he thinks I'm gay and all that. I was just having a bit of a laugh. I wasn't taking him too seriously. And uh, I was struggling a little bit because I was thinking, I, I, I know the, I know one of the earliest um, lists of the canon, which is Athanasius, and the bit about the book of Revelation I've read a lot about in the past, but I was struggling to remember some of the scholarship behind it. But I, So... I was struggling for a little bit. Then I said, look, let me get my sources, because I've got sources on the Quran, and uh, I needed to get something specific on the, on the book of Revelation, which uh, if you want to read something, if you go to uh, the book of Revelation in the, in the canon by uh, Dr. Kruger, that'll help you if you want to understand about the book of Revelation, how it got into the canon, etc. So anyhow, I was struggling a little bit because I, I, I couldn't remember list of canon with the book of Revelation in. So I said to him, look, and, and I genuinely need, we, I had loads of files and they were all in a mess. I said, look, just give me five minutes, I'll go, have a break, I need a drink, and I'll come back with, with my sources. So I had a break, come back. So I came back. So then he starts going on about um, sources and, and banging on about that. And I said, no, look, if yours is proper scholarship, You've got to be quoting. You, you're going on about er, Bart Ehrman, because he was going on about Bart Ehrman a lot. I says, and you're quoting this article. I said, it's not proper scholarship. You're not engaging with scholars against them. He said, do, do all articles have to be like that? I said, but if you're going to be a proper scholar, you've got to be, if you're going to present your view, you've got to show that you're engaging with other scholars. I said, when I got my degree, I had to engage with other scholars. You've got to engage with them. So, he, he kind of like, let's, let's look at the sources, and he, and he mentioned Westcott and all. Westcott, I said, have you read Westcott? He didn't even know who Westcott was. Westcott is a, is a 19th century bishop. He's a spirit, he was a spiritualist. I've read, I've read his letters. He didn't know that. He wouldn't let me talk about that. He just moved on. Then he said, oh, you don't know anything about origin and the list that he had. Now, he was saying that the list of, of the book of Revelation was not in origin. And I said, well, actually, I have an article here, and I actually had an article, which I'd read, but it doesn't, have, it, it's on about the list, but it doesn't actually uh, put all the books in, but it's discussing here. Uh, it's called uh, Another Look at the Earliest Complete List of the Canon of the New Testament, July 12, 2016, by Michael Kruger. And, and basically the article is just saying we need to relook at this because some people are saying that the list was interpolated, it was manufactured by a later scholar. But Kruger and some other scholars have, have been going back and they, they, they're beginning to see that, think, no, this is a genuine origin. So my first point is about the book of Revelation. My first point is this is if you read uh, this article on cannon fodder or you go michaelkruger.com what is the earliest complete list of the New Testament can can canon of the New Testament October 19th 2015 in the study of the New Testament canon scholars like to highlight that the first time we see a complete list of 27 books inevitably the list containing Athanasius' famous letter. 
is mentioned as the first time this happened. That's in 367. As a result, it is often claimed that the New Testament was late phenomenon. We didn't have a New Testament according to Athanasius until the end of the 4th century. But this sort of reasoning is problematic on a number of levels. First, we don't measure the existence of the New Testament just by the existence of lists. When we examine the way certain books were used by the early church fathers, it is evident that there was functioning canon long before the 4th century. And that's what I emphasised all day uh, with uh, Mansur. I emphasised this point, which he and the other Muslims were not getting. It is evident that there is a functioning canon long before the 4th century, and I prove that by showing the quotes of the early church fathers. So what I'm saying is before there was a list of New Testament books in the canon, there were, the early church was using the canon well before that. Second, indeed by the second century there is already a core collection of New Testament books functioning as scripture. Second, there are reasons to think that Athanasius' list is not the earliest complete list we possess in the recent uh, festrift for Lyra for Larry Hotro, Mark Manuscript and Monotheism, edited by Chris Keith and director Roth, T.T. Clark, 2015. I wrote an article entitled Origins List of New Testament Books, a homily on Joshua 7.1, A Fresh Look. In that article, I argued that around 250 AD, Origin likely produced a complete list of all 27 New Testament books books more than a hundred years before Athanasius. In this typical allegorical fashion, Origen used the story of Joshua to describe the New Testament canon. But when our Lord, Origen, the early church father, when our Lord Jesus Christ comes, uh, whose arrival that prior son of none designated, he sends priests, his apostles bearing trumpets, uh, hammered thin, the magnificent and the heavenly instruction a proclamation. Matthew first sounded priestly. Mark also, John, Luke and John played their own priestly trumpets. Even Peter cries out with trumpets in two of the epistles and James. Jude John also sounds the trumpet through the epistle and revelation and the acts of the apostles. So here, so Mansur's whole argument was that the book of Revelation was not in the canon like for centuries and centuries. I said, I agreed with him and I admitted that there were debates about the book of Revelation being in the canon for centuries and I explained why. Because some of the early church fathers took different views on eschatology and some early church fathers thought other early church fathers were really wrong in the way they looked at eschatology and the book of Revelation was involved in these debates on eschatology. So early church fathers were like some of them were a bit dubious about the book of Revelation, not because of the book itself, but because of these debates. But here is proof positive that Mansur, when he's going on about all these other canons of list in uh, later on, that, that even the first very list that we have, and um, Kruger's arguing that this is genuine list, is the book of Revelation. So. To cap it all, basically, this part of the uh, video, basically, <clears throat> it was very difficult to articulate to Mansur and the Muslims because the Muslims would not give me a proper opportunity to, to speak and Mansur wouldn't. And that's why I kept butting in. That's why I kept saying Dr. Brower, Dr. Brower. That's why I kept having a bit of fun because I knew that they just weren't going to let play fair with me, you know. So, basically, what I was trying to get across to them is when that Dr. Bauer had theories of community that he used to interpret ancient texts of the New Testament. These views have impacted modern scholarship today, where a lot of textual critics like Bauer Ehrman have theories of community, i.e. there was never a Christian community, there were all sorts of different communities and there was never a canon. And so they come into the context of the debate with these views. Mansour, 
He's influenced, he's, he, he clearly showed later on he's influenced by Bart Herman. Mansour's influenced by Bart Herman, and Bart Herman is in that f academic flow. So when we're looking at ancient sources, when we're looking at fragments, when we're looking at ancient documents of the church, they're coming with this view of interpretation. The interpretation I'm giving you is a different view. It's a different view. It's saying that, you know, number one, there is a canon. Uh, number two, the canon was already evident, not in a list, but primarily in the quotations of the early church fathers, which show where they saw, you know, for example, they saw the Gospels of, as authoritative, you know. So, for example, you know, this is before any, any, uh, For any uh, list, canonical list, we have this, statements like this, you know. canonical list is made, we have this, in the 2nd century, there are four Gospels and only four, neither more nor less, four like the points of the compass, four like the chief direction of the wind, the church spread, and he goes on, um, he's on about the Gospel, he says, John actually speaks of highly, his kingly and glorious sonship, in the beginning of the word, Luke begins with Zechariah, Matthew chooses first, uh, and Mark leads off, etc. So there, before there's any kind of uh, canon, it's clear the early church saw the four Gospels as the Word of God. And that was the point that I was trying to get in, but he won't let me get it in. He won't let me explain. Okay. Right, so so we, 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 we jousted on uh, bias scholarship, talking about bias scholarship, and I was trying to point out that his scholarship was biased. And I, I wanted time, I offered him a proper academic debate, he didn't want to take it up. So he's not interested in truth, Mansour wasn't interested in truth. And I actually left the debate later on, because I said to the Muslim brothers there, who were filming, I said, can I use the video of the debate with Mansour, they wouldn't let me use it. They said I can link to it, but I can't use it. In other words, I can't put it on my website. So that, what, that tells you they're going to edit the video. Because if they were going, if they let me use the video, I could have the full video, put it on, and then people can see it for themselves. But they wouldn't let me take the video and use it, put it on my website. They said I could link to it. So what that means is, I'm in a debate with people who were actually editing videos, who were not being intellectually honest. And that was what Shamsi did. I debated Shamsi, and Shamsi edited the video. He made a bit. He said he, it, the videos have run out. We can't film. I couldn't answer a question that he asked about the Incarnation. He went off, uh, claimed victory, then made a video clip, put that video clip in, in the video to try and make a spin on it. You know, and it was kind of dishonest of him, really. And I met Shamsi, uh, and he's a, uh, he's a lovely guy. I like the guy. He's very likeable. But he's intellectually dishonest because he just wasn't willing to be honest about what he did. And Mansour's guys are the, are the same ones that were filming then. Shamsi, they were filming with Mansour. And they're intellectually dishonest. They wouldn't let me use that video. They wouldn't let me take that video and, and put it on my website. So, so we jousted a bit. And then I hit him with this. I hit him with this. I said to him, well, you're... You're on about the canon of the Bible. Your canon, your manuscripts, etc. There were bits of the Quran taken out here, there, and everywhere. And, you know, there was a lot of uh, stuff that's showing your early sources that the Quran, and uh, that the Quran we have today is, is, is not the Quran that you had in, in, at the beginning. So I quoted Bukhari al-Bukhari, uh, al volume 6, 61, 
number 556 Khan. Say, Sayer al Bakari, volume 6, 61, 513 Khan. Sunnah Abdu Dawud, 310, 15. Number 1015 Hassan, Sayyid al Bakari, volume 6, B61, 514 Khan. Sayyid al Bakari, volume 6, 61, number 509 Khan. Sunni al Tiramithi, 3103, Creedly, etc. And I have loads of stuff here. Then I, I said to him, So if you read these, um, if you read these, uh, uh, hadiths, we, we learn, like for example, in Sari Bukhari, volume 6, 61556, Masum uh, makes this big argument of the chain of narration that, that the Quran was uh, narrated, uh, passed on by word of mouth. Well, in that Sayyid Bukhari, volume 661, we see here that Muhammad forgot a verse. So he's, uh, Mansur is saying, look, the, uh, there was this chain of narration where people remembered the Quran. But even your own prophet couldn't remember the Qur'an. So your chain of narration is faulty before it even gets off the ground. We have here in Bukhari, volume 661, 513, Muhammad requires seven different ways, uh, uh, versions of reading. Now, that I, can, I know that Mansur makes technical arguments that the seven ways of reading are actually just seven ways of reading. But really, that's just an excuse to to the fact that there are seven different variants, seven, you know, there's issues there where it's not one Qur'an, that there are other Qur'ans and there's a lack of honesty about that, you know, there's deception. That's why Uthman burnt the Qur'an. You know, we have here, we have here, and this is the intellectual dishonesty of Muslim scholars and Islam you know, my brothers and sisters, is this is intellectual dishonesty. We have here, I have here in uh, Sayyid Bukhari, volume 6, page 476. I won't read it all, but it, it says, Uthman returned the original manuscripts to Hafa. Uthman sent every Muslim province one copy of what they made, copied and ordered all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts of all copies, to be burned. Sayyid Bukhari, volume 6. Uh, page 479. So there, in your own resources, in your own hadith, uh, Uthman burns the Quran. And this was the debate, this was a debate about the the different ways of repeating the Quran. And there, you have the internal defeat, the internal, um, really, the internal implosion of the Islamic view of the chain of narration and the seven different views. Because the argument is, we have these seven different ways of pronouncing the Qur'an and they're valid, they're not variants, they're not different Qur'ans. So why would uh, Uthman burn the Qur'ans? If it's just seven ways of reciting and he brings all the other Qur'ans that he has together and then burns them and has one Qur'an, what has that got to do with chain? Uh, uh, the the seven ways of pronouncing the Quran and the chain of narration. What it uh, what it tells you is there is a problem with chain of narration. That number one, you need a text. And um, and just a side issue, Abu Bakr was never given authority by Muhammad to have a paper Quran. Nowhere in the Hadiths did, was any Muslim given the authority by Muhammad to produce a paper Qur'an. So the Qur'an that you have in your hand has no authority. No prophet, nobody gave them authority to make a paper Qur'an. That's just on the side. But the point is that when a Muslim scholar makes the argument of chain of narration that the Qur'an was passed on, we have quite clearly in Uthman, he burnt the Qur'ans. So when you're saying that it's seven ways of pronouncing and we've got chain of narration as... as guarantor of the Qur'an being passed on. The fact that Uthman had to make one standardized text proves that chain of narration doesn't work. And secondly, it shows there were textual variants. It wasn't just about pronunciation. Otherwise, he wouldn't have burnt the other Qur'ans. All right? 
So, um, Masur quote, quoted uh, Ba Ermer, Ba Ermer, I said to him, this is a Muslim scholar, variant readings of the Quran, 1998, International Institute of Islamic Thought, Hamad Ali Am Al Imam. I said to him, is he a good scholar? He went, hmm? I said, well, you know, I've been reading it. You're quoting Bar Ehrman, a biased scholar for you. I'm, I've been reading your, your own scholars. You know? So, then he hits me with some flurry from Bar Ehrman again and stuff like that. And then, and then I just, I just absolutely floored him. I just said this, I said, I said to him, well, I said, you're going about chain of narration and these classical sources. And this is what, this is the killer. And this is what I'm trying to get at in this video. This is the main issue in the video. He didn't come back on me on these quotations of the Hadith. He didn't intellectually engage with these Hadiths. He went on attacking the Bible. He didn't engage with the quotations that I gave of these Hadiths. And the intellectual implications for Islam. He would not engage with them and tried to avoid them. They kept calling me gay in the process. I offered to debate him. He wouldn't debate me. A proper debate. I said, I've an academic debate. Let me get the sources. Let me get it. Let me get ready for it. He wouldn't let me do it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. Um, he'd rather rely on Islamic awareness rather than engaging proper scholarship on the topic. So... So then I hit him with my killer punch. I said to him, the Quran that you use, I said, what Quran do you use? He said, blah, blah, blah. I use seven or whatever. I said, okay. I said, if, if any of those, if any of those Qurans got a critical edition, is there a critical edition of the Quran? He went, yeah. So I said, okay. So he went, because the classical sources, ancient classical sources, we were able to do, uh, we have from ancient classical sources, we've got the Quran. So the Quran that we have is from these ancient classical sources, and so therefore uh, we have a critical edition. I said, that's it's just intellectual vacuous. I said, when we have the NIV, we find many, many New Testament manuscripts, and we collate all those manuscripts, we bring them together, and we make a critical edition because of the new scholarship that comes. There have been many, many Qurans that have been found, and yet you're not bringing them all together and making a critical edition of the Quran today. I says that is intellectual. That's just it's not even on the map for being intellectual. That is just a joke. And he bangs on about his classical sources again. I said, well, wait a minute. You can bang on about your classical sources, but number one, uh, your own early sources, and I read these hadiths, show that there are variants within your earliest manuscripts. Secondly, you're on about chain of narration that the Quran has been preserved. Uh, well, Muhammad couldn't even remember some of the Quran. So you, this argument of chain narration doesn't work. This argument of chain narration is not intellectually honest. It's an excuse not to do textual criticism. People like Tabari and your early Islamic scholars, if you look, there are countless, there are many, many Islamic ancient Islamic scholars from the, uh, Tabari to the 13th century, that engaged in textual criticism. They were honest about textual variants. You know, but today you're not willing to engage. So you, you're just being intellectually dishonest. And to be honest, I just, I absolutely, I'm not just saying it, he, I absolutely destroyed the guy. And when I finished, I said to the guy as we were filming the cameras, I said, can I use the video? And they went, no. So I said, right, well, I'm off. And that's it. And then I left, and then he went on his sermon, and he, he was at the cameras telling them whatever, you know, giving his bias spiel. And, and to be honest, to be honest, you know, that's what I found with atheists. Atheist apologists. People like Aaron Ra, Thunderfoot, the atheist community online. Sometimes I, I, I debated Aaron Ra and Thunderfoot and DPR Jones on the Magic Sandwich Show. I brought the best scholarship I could bring. I brought cutting-edge scholarship on uh, 
historical Jesus studies, and I couldn't get it. I couldn't get it out because they were just they were just like they knew they didn't have the answers, so they were just mocking, and then they were just like getting angry, and then trying. And then I was raising my voice, and people listening were thinking, "Oh, it's not scholarly." But it was a it, the way they were doing it. They were they were doing it so that people wouldn't take me seriously. So I couldn't get my scholarship through, and it was the same with Masur. He was trying to do the same, and to be honest, I just thought, well, you're not really interested. Well, I'm having a nice day. I'm just having a bit of fun, and I was just having a bit of fun, and I I, I wasn't being respectful to him because he he, he was he, it wasn't a serious intellectual engagement. He he didn't. Re I asked him right off the bat at the beginning, right at the beginning. Do you want an academic debate? Do you want to go down there later on uh, next week and? have it out in a proper academic way. You have five minutes, speak, I have five minutes, and do it uh, in a proper way. And he said no. So when he said that, I thought, I'm, I'm, I don't take you seriously then. You're not, you're not a serious contender for, a, for an academic discussion here. And, and, and I, just, I just kept interrupting him and I kept, I kept having a bit of a laugh and stuff like that, you know. But the point is, he never came back on those points. And Shamsi is one, he's down. And now Mansour is down. So he's down. He, he could not deal with the arguments that I gave about the critical edition of the Quran. Why isn't there a critical edition today of the Quran? He could not answer that. He could not deal with it on intellectual grounds. Shamsi is the same. He could not deal with it. They, 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 they're intellectually dishonest. They don't have the scholarship. They, they, and they don't want you to know the truth. You know... They just don't want you to know the truth. Honestly, they don't. If they did, why won't they let me use the video? If if they do want you to know the truth, why is it they don't let? Why is it uh, Mansour uh, wouldn't debate me properly on an academic level, so I can get my scholarship out and show him that what he's saying is wrong? He he, he doesn't want you to know the truth. Shamsi doesn't want you to know the truth. You know. And if you believe them, you, 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 you believe in them and walking in darkness, not because, and it's because you, you're allowing your conscience to be seared, you're allowing your conscience to be, to be dampened, you know what they're doing is wrong, you know their arguments are not good, and they know that, they know their arguments are not good. Mansour, at the end of the debate, I saw his face, he knew he was beat, he knew he was beat, he knew he was beat. He knew he was beat, but he, he forced himself to keep going, like a dog with the bone, but he knew that he was beat. So this is a, a technical video on dealing with Mansour, and I think really we can wrap up with Paul Williams. I think the uh, canon of the New Testament uh, by Michael Kruger, July 12th, really kind of deals with um, deals with with Paul Williams really. But I'll just deal with Paul Williams. Uh, he's very cocky, um, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he's quite clever. He's quite a smart guy. And he's quite a formidable debater, really, to be honest. Um, I found, out of all the apologists down there so far, I found um, Paul Williams, personally, I mean, Mike, Mike my friend, he, he, he kind of was all right. But I, I kind of find uh, Paul Williams, I, I found, I've crossed roads a few times with Paul Williams, and I, and I found him, he's, he's a very erudite debater. Uh, he's a very good debater, and uh, a couple of times I'll be on, I'll be I'll be honest. I, I've, I've crossed swords with uh, Paul Williams three three times, and two times he's caused me problems. Uh, not that I haven't got the answers or the or the scholarship, but he is very very good at polemical debate, and I'll, I'll, unless you. The, the, I think that why he, he kind of 
off foots me is, is number one, I haven't debated it properly. I haven't had a proper like debate and discussion. And number two, he kind of gets you off guard because he just brings a subject up that you. It just comes out of the blue. You, you just appear somewhere, brings up a topic, and you're not ready for it. But if, if uh, and also like in the video, you know, uh, he was causing me some problems. He was asking questions. I was answering them, but I couldn't get my side in. And then later on, I thought, right, I'll ask him a question. I asked him a question, and he wouldn't answer it. So I said, well, forget it. But uh, near the end of the day, I was tired and. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't think straight anyway, you know. But I'm just being in touch, to be honest, that he, I think he's a very, for all his faults, I think he, he, he's a very strong debater. Um, but, again, like Masur, the intellectual dishonesty, and there's, there is there, Paul, you've got to let people come in. And he wouldn't let me come in, he wouldn't let me ask questions, he wouldn't let me challenge, you know. So so he might be good in one respect, but he's not good in another, you know. So, I'll refer you to an article by... to an article uh, by, it's called The Biographical Test Update by Clay Jones on the Christian Institute. Now this article basically is looking at it from a secular point of view, it's looking at what scholars say about ancient literature. And, and it says this, the biographical test examines manuscript reliability for more than a generation. Christian apologists have employed it to substantiate the transmission of reliability of the New Testament. The bibliographic the bibli the biblio sorry, the bibliographical test compares the clauses of the New Testament oldest extant manuscripts to the date of its autograph, the original handwritten documents, and the sheer number of the New Testament extant manuscripts with the number of earliest extant manuscripts of other ancient documents such as Homer, Aristotle and Herodotus. So it's the Bibliographical Test Update by Clay Jones on Christian Institute. Now, basically, I'll just show you now. So basically, it's just showing you that so Paul Williams' argument is how many first century manuscripts will we have? of the New Testament, we don't. How many of the second, we, we don't have many. How many third century? So he's saying in the first two centuries we don't have a lot of manuscripts. But what he doesn't tell you is that we do have a lot of manuscripts coming into the fourth century, fifth century, we have thousands of manuscripts. And that's what he doesn't want to tell you, you see. And so this argument here kind of compares the manuscripts we have with the New Testament with ancient documents and see see what we learn from that. So like Omer's Hilliad, 800 BC, earliest MS, 400 BC, time gap 400 years, and we have We have, I think, 1,757 copies, ancient copies of Homer. And the time gap of our first copy is 400 years. Herodotus' history, 480 to 425 BC. Earliest manuscript, 10th century. Time gap, 1,350 years. We have 109 copies. It's the fossils, plays. Date written 496 406 BC, earliest MS 3rd BC, time gap 1 to 200 years, we have 193 copies. Plato, tragic uh, writings, uh, tetra, 
Tetralogies, 400 BC, earliest manuscript 895, time gap 1300, we have 210 copies. Caesar's Gaelic Wars, 100 to 44 BC, earliest manuscript 9th century, um, time gap 950 years, and manuscripts 251. Livy's History of Rome, 59 BC to 17 AD, early 5th century manuscript. Time gap 400 years, 150 copies, I think. Tacitus, Annals, AD 100, uh, earliest manuscript, 2nd century, half of it, 2nd century, and then uh, 1100 AD. Time gap 750 to 950 years. Copies 31, round right about 31. Pliny the Elder, Natural History AD 4979, Fifth Fragment, etc. Irish manuscripts, 14th to 15th century. Time gap 400 and copies 200. Thucydides History. 460 to 400 BC, um, and we have 96 copies. Demetrius' speeches, um, time gap 1,000 years, over, over 1,000 years, and 340 copies. New Testament, we have. AD 50. We have AD 130 or less within 40. Time gap 3. Yeah. Time gap 40. And we have 5,306. We have 5,795 copies. goes into there are more than 2,000 Armenian MS and the number would be greater we have around 975 Coptic we have six Gothic we have 600 Ethiopian we have 10,000 Latin translations we have 350 Syriac we have Georgian 43 Slavic 4,000 so So we write, he writes, she writes, how low estimate of Slavic New Testament MS is 4,000? With some estimate much higher, University of Indiana Slavic professor Henry Cooper writes, the most thorough description of the manuscript holdings of Slavic countries to date, conducted in 1965 on the territory of the Soviet Union, yielded in all about 1,500 More than 99% of these manuscripts were translated usually from Greek. And the vast majority of these were biblical books, especially portions of the Gospels and the Psalms. Cooper added that an account for the 15th century added 3,500 more entries. On the higher end, Sir Peter University professor writes that for the first time in the history of Slavics, the number of selected Gospel manuscripts has reached the significant figure of over 1,100. So what it's saying is to Paul Williams there, all right, the first two centuries we don't have many manuscripts, but when we start getting into the 3rd, 4th and 5th century, it just escalates to thousands and thousands. So it's obvious that these early, the earlier manuscripts were there, you know, it confirms that. Patristic quotations. All told, the sheer number of New Testament manuscripts and the earliness of the extant manuscripts gives us great reason to believe that the New Testament accurately transmits the contents of the autographs. But there's more than that. Metzer and Ehrman point out the huge number of quotations from the early church fathers. Besides textual evidence derived from the New Testament Greek manuscripts and from early versions, the textual critic has available the numerous scriptural quotations including the commentary, sermons and other treatises written by the early church fathers. Indeed, so extensive are these citations that if all other sources of the knowledge of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of the practically the entire New Testament. 53.
Metza and Erm in the text of the New Testament. Although there has been an increase in the number of non-New Testament ancient manuscripts, nothing has changed regarding the applicability of the bibliographical text. Test. Even Homer's Iliad, which has been the greatest manuscript increase, is still dwarfed by the New Testament, which is more than three times the Greek manuscripts as the Iliad. When one adds the 15,000 manuscripts in other languages and then considers that almost the entire New Testament could be reproduced by the quotations, of the early church fathers, one must maintain that despite the increase of non-New Testament ancient manuscripts, the New Testament remains in a class by itself, it is by far the most attested ancient work. This troubles sceptics because if they reject the transmission or reliability of the New Testament, then they must also consider it unreliable all other manuscripts of antiquity. As John Warwick Montgomery has often related some years ago, when I debated philosopher Professor Avril Scroll, Stroll at the University of British Columbia on this point, he responded, All right, I throw out all my knowledge of the classical world, at which the chairman of the classics department cried, Good Lord Avril, not, not that. Clay Jones is associate professor in the Master of Arts in Christian Apologetics program at Bible University and teaches the class in, in the defence of the resurrection. Now Clay Jones if you go look at his writing, if you go and look at him, he will engage with scholars that differ from him. So, that, so yeah, this is on a Christian website, it's by Clay Jones. But I, I've seen Clay Jones in action, and he will, do, he, will, he will encourage people to go and look at different views. He will encourage people to look at different scholarship. They, they'll, 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 uh, you know, they'll encourage called her she, he, she, she before, uh, but the, the, the Biola University, a uh, uh, Christian university, but if you go to that university and you go and look at them, they, they encourage scholarship, they encourage you to go and study and look at the opposing view, whereas the Islamic awareness side doesn't, even the Christian Research Institute will encourage you to go and look at other scholars, and they have scholars on their staff. Staff. They have scholars that write articles, and but they will put sources where you can go and investigate differently, as well. You know, with Islamic awareness, you know. So. But the point is, in my scholarship today, I have used Christian sources, but in my scholarship, I have quoted a Muslim scholar, a formidable Muslim scholar, who is a textual critic, who, who's written a, uh, a book on textual criticism. I've read quite a, a chunk of it. I've read about a quarter of that book, you know? And so my, my, my approach is that, you know, that, that scholar, uh, I mean, if you disagree with me, and this is my point. If you disagree with me, go and read Variant Readings of the Quran, 1998, International Institute of Islamic Thought, Ahmad Ali al Imam. You go and read him, and he will be completely different from what I say. And go and read Islamic Awareness, go and read their website, go and look at their website. Uh, but also, uh, if you're going to look at their website, go also to Answering Islam as well. And that's, all, that's what I like. I like to do that in my apologetics. You'll find in my apologetics, when I debate people, I will often say in my debates with people, I'll sell them the latest scholarship on, say, um, uh, Josephus and I'll say this scholar disagrees with me that scholar disagrees with me but go and read them you know for example I've debated people on the eyewitness accounts of Jesus and I've said well you know Bart Ehrman disagrees with me he's written a number of books on this go and read what he has to say but I take a different opinion this is the scholars that agree with me go there you see and it's and so that that's my kind of approach 
that that's a proper scholarly way you know when I when I pulled out um, um, what's his name uh, Lee Strubble you know I, I, I actually brought that book down because it's not scholarly work but I actually brought it down because of the Bruce Metzer thing. I thought the Bruce Metzer might come up and I thought it was a useful resource because it has a full interview of his, uh, of his up-to-date opinions before he died of what he thought about the New Testament, which the Muslims would not want to hear. So I wasn't bringing it as a scholarly resource, but what I was bringing it as is an accurate resource about his views rather than a cherry-picking bit of a quote which uh, Masu... Uh, Mansour was doing. So I finished now. I finished my. Um, so, if if you want to, uh, if you want to know about canon, um, if you want to know about the canon, um, if you go onto my website, jasonburnspreacher.com there is a page there about the canon of scripture. If you want to uh, study in depth the New Testament and issues of canon, there's three volumes by Theodosa that you can download. And, and these, these uh, are massive books. Uh, they're old books, but they give you a different view to Bruce Metzer. Uh, I, I've read Bruce Messer. I think that he wasn't wise in some things that he was saying and he took a, a certain view about the early church fathers which I disagree with uh, and the debate is with the early church fathers when they quoted uh, the gospel and the New Testament were they quoting them as the word of God or not he says no other scholars say yeah and I say yeah so I don't think he was wise on that I take a different opinion. I take them a more classical approach uh, by Theodore Zahn. So. Somebody following. 